Hello, everyone, and happy 2020. I hope your new year is off to as fabulous a start as mine. My daughter finished her master's program, started her research work at Penn, my alma mater, but best of all, she will be taking over the rest of her student loan payments. So <laughs> this is, uh-oh, oh, my husband and me. Yes, one down and one to go. My warmest welcome, or welcome back, to each and every one of you. I'm Denise. And returning with me today to present is QAD and MRP expert, Don Lindsay. As always, Don has much to cover, so very quickly, please know that everyone connects to the webinar already muted, but you can type in your questions or comments at any time throughout the session. You type them into the bottom of your control panel where I have the red arrow pointing. I will hand off to Don Lindsay, who is a business analyst for several companies and has 18 years of QAD ERP experience. Throughout those years, Don has worked with seven different versions of QAD. So welcome back, Don, and whenever you are ready. Yep, you got it. Gotcha. Okay, so as uh, Denise says, uh, a Happy New Year. I hope everyone had a great holiday season. I'm sure we all used uh, Amazon and e-commerce and Alibaba, and we basically made uh, <clears throat> the economy a much better place to live in by spending all of our money. Mine was great. Uh, Denise got her uh, little gal uh, ready to pay off her student loans. I got to visit my uh, grandsons in Colorado, my oldest grandson is joining the Navy, so we're excited about that. So uh, <clears throat> it's been a great 2019, and we're looking very much forward to 2020. Uh, purchasing is pretty pertinent these days with all the potential uh, issues we have, uh, Iran, uh, possible World War III, impeachment, tariffs, taxes, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. So what we'd like to do today is to talk about how QED gives you the tools to deal with the various vicissitudes of the receipt side of the supply chain. So today we're going to uh, discuss uh, purchasing, how to set it up, uh, a little bit of how to process it, uh, and look at some of the functionality within QED for purchasing. So we'll cover uh, a fair amount of subjects. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. <clears throat> as we say each time we have one of our talks, uh, there are many, many terms, definitions that one needs to become aware of when dealing with, in this case, purchasing. There's uh, always a new term, and uh, you might use that term somewhat differently than I do or others uh, might use. So if you have a question about any of the terms we use or uh, a question, please uh, send either Denise or I a uh, quick little email. Remember, a solid work instructions and a good company data dictionary. I always refer to that uh, great little article that uh, Bill Linder wrote uh, for the uh, Web Mug 2018 spring session called I Love My QAD Wiki. So it always helps to be able to define what you're dealing with in uh, terms of, in this case, purchasing. So what is purchasing? Purchasing is a business or organization's attempt to acquire goods and services to accomplish its goal. It uh, involves sourcing, supply management, requirements, definitions, categories, supplier identification, RFQs, contracts, etc. And then the actual procurement process of identifying need, requisitions, approval, purchase orders. And so today we're going to concentrate primarily on this side of the purchasing uh, equation. There's lots of uh, things to think about with uh, purchasing. Basically, purchasing is your door to the world. This is where you define how you acquire uh, products. It's probably one of the most important aspects of your supply chain because everybody needs to buy something to build the product that you're going to ship unless you grow it internally. 
And when you buy things, you've got to concern yourself with the economy, with tariffs, with contracts, with MRP, blanket orders. There's just a whole bunch of aspects of purchasing that you need to be aware of. And so we'll try and cover uh, a lot of those. The objectives of purchasing are, are really pretty simple. Get the right quantity of the right quality at the right price and to satisfy the manufacturing of the items that you build for your cust customers. So it's uh, it's not too difficult, but however, it does involve a whole lot of uh, things. We'll look at purchasing just a little bit in terms of MRP. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time uh, on MRP. Uh, we've covered that in June and July of uh, 2018 with a couple of webinars that uh, we have. But here uh, is where purchasing sits in terms of uh, MRP in the QAD ERP system. We've got uh, sales orders, uh, planning parameters, lead times, on time, et cetera. That drives into MRP. And then MRP plans purchase orders. And we'll talk about how we take those MRP planned orders and turn them into uh, purchase orders a little bit later. If you want to look at uh, some of the aspects of MRP on our 32 soft website, uh, just type in uh, MRP and it'll take you to that series of uh, webinars we've had in the past. Lots of users of purchase data, primarily buyers, receiving personnel, finance personnel, uh, the receipt of requisitions, the entering of POs, receiving the product, confirming vouchers, the payment process, reconciliation, but there are a lot of other organizations within or departments within the organization that still want to know about purchasing status. Shop floor, uh, R&D is usually interested in uh, what they're uh, ordering and getting engineering, defining part numbers, and obviously accounting and financial planning. So uh, as we saw with inventory, there's a lot of people who use uh, purchasing data and we want to make sure that it's as accurate and on time as uh, possible. There are five basic areas of uh, purchasing activity, sourcing. Uh, we won't talk a lot about that. Uh, value analysis, how do you find lowest cost? Uh, contracting, I'll just mention a little bit about contracting, and then uh, budgeting, one of the primary tools uh, that uh, buyers give to the finance area are their best estimation is of what they're going to buy over the course of the next three months, months, year, uh, so we can do some uh, budgeting. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then Purchasing execution, uh, supplier schedules, releasing purchase orders, controlling POs, expediting, de-expediting based on MRP, uh, and then uh, closing out and interfacing with accounting on accounts payable. So we're going to spend most of our time uh, talking about this uh, execution process. A requisition, if you remember from uh, one of my previous uh, uh, webinars, I mentioned the two terms, nomothetic and idiomatic. Nomothetic is kind of a general, average, uh, conceptual sort of thing. Idiomatic is at the detail level, the part number level. So we do the purchasing cycle based on an nomothetic idea of how we're going to process things, but we actually do the purchasing cycle on individual part numbers on individual POs. And that starts off with receiving the uh, requisition from the user, uh, selecting vendors, determining uh, potential vendors, looking for quotes, uh, selecting the right vendor, and then we determine the price. We issue a purchase order. We follow up to make sure the dates are met. We receive the product in the inventory and then finally approve uh, the vendor for payment. There's uh, basically the control of purchase orders has to do with open orders and maintaining the open order status. So that's what we use these tools in QAD to do is to allow us to place the purchase orders and maintain accurate status. Then once we have processed the PO, the receipt, et cetera, the supplier is going to send us 
his invoice to pay it, and then it's purchasing's responsibility to interact with accounts payable to make sure that uh, the original invoice, the original purchase order, receiving records are all coordinated so that it can be purchased uh, and paid to the supplier uh, in a timely manner. <clears throat> As with any area of QED, inventory, MRP, uh, purchasing, there's key databases, tables that exist within the QED database that have the information about our vendors, our suppliers, our open purchase order reports, uh, our open POs, our receipts. And so you should try to the best of your ability to become familiar with those tables, what they contain, how accurate they are, uh, vendor master, credit master, address, PO, PO detail, transaction. Uh, these are defined in either the database definitions PDF or the entity diagram PDF. So I would recommend you get familiar with uh, both of those uh, aspects of the data <coughs> in QAD that uh, underlines what we're going to be talking about in terms of purchasing. I won't try and explain uh, 362580 Progress Editor, but that is, in fact, where you'll find the data dictionary, the tables, the files, the names, the formats, etc. So I'd recommend that uh, you become familiar with those uh, tables in fields that you're dealing with. Uh, centralized versus uh, decentralized, QED allows us to both do a centralized or a decentralized uh, way of purchasing. Centralized basically says everything is ordered through one organization. I've done some consultings that have their buying department in Atlanta and they purchase everything for everybody across 15 sites in the United States. There are other organizations that use decentralized uh, planning or purchasing. Uh, this would be where the buyers are actually at the facility, they're close to the people who are doing the requisitions, and they're ordering it in a decentralized. So depending on how you do that, QAD can support both of these uh, and give us information for uh, long-term price negotiation. You also, as a purchasing person, either purchasing manager or uh, buyer, should be aware of uh, the IT behind purchasing, uh, network servers, the internet uh, operating system, either Progress or, or Unix, obviously the inner workings of uh, ERP, that's what these webinars are in a, uh, uh, hopefully gonna give you some more information on, uh, Apache Tomcat uh, email systems. So you don't have to be an expert in uh, these IT issues, but it's very helpful if you understand uh, how those work, uh, email, uh, internet, those kinds of uh, things. So QAD allows us to do both the centralized or decentralized uh, purchasing. There's non-inventory purchasing, uh, things such as MRO, uh, office supplies, etc. And QAD allows us to use the purchasing system in QAD to uh, look at these non-inventory items for capital goods, services, et cetera. And it just basically requires the ability to differentiate inventory from non-inventory items. In the later versions of QAD, there's this little field on the item master file 1.4.1 that says, uh, is this a memo type or what type of uh, part is this? If you type in an M in this uh, field that basically says that whatever that part number is in the item master file, it's not going to affect uh, inventory, but it will default to a memo line type in both a purchase order uh, or a sales order. Uh, there is also this newer application of QAD called EAM, Enterprise Asset Management, and that allows us to do some uh, more sophisticated processing of non-inventory items or purchasing for 
uh, your organization. It allows you to set up product. Uh, EAM is uh, now integrated into the later versions, 2018, 2019 of EAM. Uh, so you can buy things in EAM, but it does interface to the QAD ERP purchasing. Uh, it allows us to do uh, purchase items, non-stock items, services, uh, consignment, uh, quotes, all those kinds of things. For those of us that know the QAD purchasing, uh, quotes has never been a real strong point of uh, <clears throat> QAD purchasing, but uh, EAM allows us to do that. We use vendor numbers from ERP. Uh, an EAM purchase order is basically a memo item in ERP, as we mentioned with that uh, memo item. Uh, it allows electronic routing and approval options. You can have non-inventory inventory, and there is a rudimentary stock replenishment functionality in AM that basically co covers the uh, reorder point uh, logic. It's not MRP, but it is uh, reorder point. A little bit about control files. Uh, we remember that every aspect of QAD has a control file, inventory, purchasing, et cetera. Uh, and you should be aware of all of the control files, their settings, what they do uh, in terms of controlling, in this particular case, uh, purchasing in 5.24. Now, in the later versions of uh, EE as opposed to SE, uh, QAD separated most of the operational control files into uh, what are called operational accounting control files. So when you look at 5.24, you should also look at uh, 36.9.3 to give you uh, an idea of what accounting settings should be done for that. Uh, here are the primary uh, control files that affect the purchasing function. You should uh, go and review most of those. I'd recommend a very hard, strong look at uh, these, especially the 5.24, the 5.2.1.24, uh, MRP control, requisition accounting control. Look at those. Make sure your accounting people are happy with those settings and make any adjustments that uh, you might find uh, necessary. The 5.24 purchasing control, uh, on this particular menu, I would be uh, very cautious of uh, this little field, approved recs for uh, PO. Uh, if you check that yes, you're going to have to use either the purchase requisition system, which we'll go over in a second, or the uh, global requisition system. Uh, it allows you to set what kind of receiver types they are. Do you not want receivers? I can't imagine not receiving, wanting receiving uh, documents. Or you print one for each shipment or for each item on a shipment. And then there are some uh, tolerance percentages that you can set. Uh, you can set whether you require an acknowledgement, uh, whether you're going to convert uh, container items uh, based on unit measures, which we'll talk about in just a second. And uh, then the second portion says, do you require a pricing table? Do you have to have it, or can you just enter prices as you want? Uh, do you require discount uh, tables? Uh, and then some header and line comments, and I would always uh, keep this, keep booking history as checked yes. That's going to give you a transaction in the transaction history file that tells you the history of your purchasing activity, and that's very handy. <clears throat> this is uh, what the purchasing and accounting control file looks like in EE. It uh, lets you set uh, the interest accrual and the interest applied accounts. Uh, you can define your bill twos, uh, <clears throat> or you're going to use day books, uh, et cetera. So you need to get with your accounting folk and make sure that they understand what those fields are and how they control the system. Product lines. Uh, are used to define how a particular transaction is going to affect the general ledger. You can have uh, hundreds of parts in a product line, but each part can only have one product line. So here in 1.21, uh, you have purchasing accounts. You can uh, set the purchasing account for 
non-inventory purchase expense. Uh, you can track uh, purchase order receipt accruals. You can uh, apply overhead. Uh, you can keep track of purchase price variance, PPV, uh, usage variance, and AP rate variance can be defined in terms of the account, the subaccount, and the cost center that you want. This is another uh, good thing to review with your <coughs> accounting folk. The 1.2.5 purchase account maintenance uh, gives you a little bit more definition of where your money is going to go in the GL. And you can uh, define this by product line, by site, by supplier type, so you can get fairly uh, detailed and keep uh, uh, a very granulated look at what accounts are going to be hit by various uh, transactions in the operational side of uh, QED. In projects, uh, a lot of uh, companies use project codes in uh, QED. So in 25.3.11.1.1, you can set up your project codes. This is basically gives you uh, that project uh, segment of the chart of accounts to provide uh, analytical reporting for activities such as uh, design work, production rework, etc. You can define a range of codes. You use GL masks to determine what those uh, account subaccount cost center projects are. And uh, just before you use it, make sure you set up your project codes and your project status codes. Those are very uh, helpful. You can also, uh, I mentioned EAM a little bit earlier in regards to purchasing. Uh, EAM has a whole uh, project control module where you can uh, manage project track costs, monitor, uh, you can uh, capitalize assets uh, into fixed assets, uh, you can authorize spend, keep track of uh, spending levels, you can have warnings, et cetera. So you want to make sure that if you're using this EAM in the newer versions of QED, you have that uh, process uh, integrated. EAM also allows you to integrate to fixed assets. Uh, I know buyers are always interested in, where's all that stuff I purchased over the last couple of years? Well, with fixed assets integration, you can, uh, create assets from jobs in EAM. Uh, you can include trailer codes. Uh, you can create uh, location fields. You can assign fixed asset IDs, service dates, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the integration of EAM to fixed assets is a, is a very strong uh, fee or functionality to, uh, to look at. As far as uh, the item master file, we've gone through the item master file a number of times before, uh, talked about uh, the various fields. If you look at just the 1.4.1 item master in relationship to purchase activities, uh, you need to define your items. We talked about uh, uniqueness of identification, only one name for one thing, not many names for the same thing, or many things with the same name. You got to have uniqueness of identification. We talked about significant, non-significant, random part numbers. We'll talk a little bit more about unit of measure. And then in the description field, always helpful to use the noun, adjective, adjective approach to uh, naming conventions. And the item data field, uh, here's your product line we talked about. Uh, status code, I'll mention that uh, in just a second. Uh, in the item data, you've also got some uh, drawing, item revision, drawing locations, size fields that are available in QAD. I always uh, remember Robert, one of my favorite uh, buyers, always used to get upset because uh, people didn't pay too much attention to these drawing and item fields. And when you're a buyer, you really need to know what uh, revision you're buying to for either a specific site or which drawing defines the current specifications or are you buying to a previous revision. So you want to make sure that these are updated uh, properly. There are fields in the uh, item inventory status, your ABC codes, uh, whether you've got lot zero control, uh, are you going to be buying to a particular site or do you only have one site? Uh, is this going to be always put into a specific location? Is that location 
uh, temperature controlled? Is it hazardous? You can define those. You can have the system automatically assign lot numbers to both uh, manufactured parts and purchased parts. Uh, you can define that by lot group. Uh, you can have shelf life uh, functionality, so you can only use parts that are not expired as yet. And then there's the fields of PO receipt active, so you can have every part number that's received go into a predefined default receipt status, maybe incoming inspection or waiting inspection, uh, and you can set that in the item master file. And we talked a little bit about that uh, memo item. In the planning areas, you always, uh, probably a good idea, unless you're using reorder point, you want to make sure that MRP is planning your orders. Uh, there's lots of uh, order policies, uh, fixed order quantity, period order quantity, lot for lot. You want to make sure that uh, for each individual part number, you've got the most applicable uh, order policy that you can uh, have for that. Uh, that is associated with the order quantity. If you use formulas, you want to make sure that your uh, batch functionality is uh, defined uh, properly, and we had a previous uh, webinar on that. Uh, order periods, if you use POQ as your order policy, you want to define how many periods out into the future. Uh, MRP will go and aggregate the gross demands to give you a planned order. Uh, you've got the safety stock, the mean absolute duration of demand modified by the difference between the lead time and the forecast interval. You can use safety uh, lead time reorder point. Uh, there's that item revision uh, that is so important to uh, buying the correct uh, revision and specification for the part. Uh, there's buyers. Some companies like buyers' names. Some companies like numbers. Uh, that's a very uh, effective tool for uh, getting at data within the system. Your supplier uh, numbers, I'll talk about that in a little bit. If you've got multiple sites, you can define and only buy into one site. You might have a centralized uh, purchasing function or receiving function where you bring it all into one facility and then from Atlanta you ship it out to uh, all your systems. So you can set that up. Here's the uh, purchase manufacturer part. For purchasing, you always want to have a P for that. Uh, whether it's inspected, what your purchasing lead time is, then you've got your MRP modifiers, min, max, multiple order quantities, which are going to play with your order policy and your order quantities and order periods. And then uh, you can tell the system how you're going to plan these particular items. Uh, in most case, purchase items are going to be based on orders, but you can have Kanban uh, functionality also. Uh, 1.4.17 is if you've got multiple sites, you want to make sure that you've got uh, item site inventory, item site cost. If you're using the service support module, you want to make sure that what you've got set up in 1.4.1 is congruent with what you have in those individual site uh, locations. 1.4.9 is your uh, item cost maintenance. This is where you set up your individual cost for a particular item. So you can see here that we got material. Uh, and at this level, uh, this particular item is uh, worth $14.15. Uh, you can also load those items in 1.4.15 uh, item cost batch load if you uh, feel that uh, necessary. There's also uh, other functions within the uh, item master area, first of all, 1.13, unit of measure. Uh, unit of measure uses the stocking unit of measure and defines an alternate unit of measure with a conversion factor. This is probably one of the primary purchasing tools because you might buy things in a case, but you might put them into stock as a bottle or a gram or an each or whatever these uh, functions within 1.4.13 allow you to define those. And I find that uh, a lot of buyers have a hard time 
conceptualizing this functionality, but it's a, it's a very important tool for the purchasing area. <clears throat> uh, 1.5.1.5 1 .1 is item status, and here you can define the status of a particular item, and then you have restricted transactions. So if you've got a part that is just uh, being released in the system, you may not want to uh, issue sales orders. You may not want to uh, do anything wet, and you can define that with the transaction codes. Same with inventory status. Inventory status is going to apply to a particular location, and you can then define whether that location is available, nettable in terms of MRP, or if you can over-issue that. If you use repetitive, you're probably going to use that uh, over-issue functionality. And then you can also uh, define restricted transactions at the individual inventory status code level. So this requires a fair amount of uh, thought and uh, pre-planning to make sure that you've got those set up. Uh, suppliers are very important to your purchasing activity. The, the, I won't go through how you select suppliers, but you want to look at their technical and manufacturing capabilities. Are they reliable? Can they ship on time? Do they have after service? Where are they located in terms of freight pricing? Uh, etc. Then once you've defined the suppliers, you want to enter into uh, a supplier agreement, a contract that defines pricing, uh, terms, delivery, quality, quantity, and uh, there's other factors involved in supplier agreements such as uh, tooling costs, warranties, delivery, proper handling, penalties. Uh, I uh, mentioned Robert before, and Robert used to spend ungodly hours uh, negotiating with suppliers on these particular aspects. Uh, an enforceable contract requires four basic things, uh, mutual offering and acceptance, a consideration in terms of quantity, price, delivery. Is it legally? Uh, applicable and uh, are the parties uh, fully competent so that uh, no individual issue would uh, cause the contract to be void. So uh, there's uh, Karis gives a great series of webinars on uh, negotiation, purchasing negotiation, if anybody has ever had the opportunity to uh, look at that. So once you've uh, got your suppliers, you identified the agreements, then you're going to go into QAD and you're going to go into 28.20.1.1, uh, supplier create. This assumes that we've got a uh, business relationship and you're going to define that business relationship. Then you've got some accounting uh, fields there that are going to be applicable based on uh, control profiles, uh, account profiles, etc. You're going to define payment uh, terms banks that you can use for a particular uh, supplier, uh, SAF codes, uh, supplemental uh, analysis fields that you can uh, enter in, uh, tax information if you're using global tax management, uh, Vertex uh, of aloe vera, those kinds of tools you need to uh, define what your taxes are, and then you can make uh, pages and pages of comments. And once you've created the supplier, and the business relationship in the EE side of QED, then you need to go into supplier data maintenance in 2.3.1. Uh, define your supplier uh, data. <clears throat> then you've got supplier pricing. Uh, you can create this in 1.10.2.1, uh, which we'll talk about in March. Uh, and then you've got supplier performance that you can define. That also we'll cover in March. Uh, EMT, we'll talk a little bit about uh, enterprise material transfer and what that means in terms of purchase orders. And then you have uh, supplier terms data that you can def define for each individual part. And then uh, address and tax data for global tax management. Uh, there's also 2.3.7 where you can define uh, PO receipts accounts and expect item receipts accounts. Uh, and this allows you to further define where your money goes in the general ledger.
So let's talk about purchase requisitions. Uh, it's a major area of compliance for SOX. And one of the things you don't want to have happen is that your purchasing requisition system is either in Word docs, Excel spreadsheets, uh, Bill Gates uh, files and fields, doesn't work very well. So for uh, purchase requisitions, you can define this as the uh, most basic time uh, type of purchase requisitions. Uh, you can define the requisition and go through a series uh, of approval, approvals. It's fairly simplistic, but uh, with discipline that can work in the newer versions of uh, QED in the EE versions, they've even gotten rid of this particular functionality. And here we have 36.9.3, requisition accounting control. And we'll talk about this when we talk about GRT. But here, uh, product line approvals. If you uh, want to have product line approvals in place, you check that box. Uh, if you want to have vertical, uh, you can have email options. This is probably one of the most important ones. Uh, prohibit change to approved requisitions. If you check that box, it adds a whole level of complexity to the process. So I'd be uh, kind of concerned about that. Then in 1.4.1, you can create a purchase requisition. And this just basically creates a document to commun communicate demand for a purchased item. You can define in 5.1.1, purchase order approval maintenance. Here's the levels that you can uh, have in the system for various approvals of requisitions. And then in 5.1.16, requisition approval maintenance. Uh, this is where you tell the system that you reviewed it and it is okay uh, to purchase for this particular item. Remember, people don't like purchasing systems. They they don't like to, they like to just jot it down on a yellow sticky pad, give it to the buyer, and say buy this. Uh, these requisition control systems, either purchase requisitions or global requisitions, uh, or even our 32 soft uh, PO rec process, require uh, a little bit more structure, and people are not uh, too happy about those. Uh, here's global requisitions. This is uh, the newer functionality of requisitions within uh, QED. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a 32 soft requisition plus that uh, if you're interested, you can uh, let me know or Denise or Alex, and we can give you a, a quick demo on how that works. But here's where you define uh, approvals, attachments, notifications, reporting, et cetera. There's the setup uh, menus. Uh, you've got the requisition control file. If this is checked using GRS, you will not be allowed to use the prequisition maintenance. That overrides the ability to use the uh, requisition. Uh, these other fields are just basic controls with the outline or header comments. <clears throat> then you define your approval levels. Uh, that can be Two levels, 1,000, 5,000, I've seen 10 approval levels. Depends on how you want it. Just makes uh, the approval level uh, related to the amount of uh, the approval required for that level. Uh, you can define categories for uh, horizontal improvement. Uh, you can define jobs, uh, and that, again, relates to the uh, EAM project controls. Uh, horizontal approval, uh, you might have a marketing manager and a sales manager that need to approve. Uh, you can do that with horizontals. Vertical approval is the normal type of uh, approval mechanism, and this is just who reports to who and who needs to sign those uh, particular purchase requisitions. If you've got a project or approval, you might have one individual who is responsible for a particular project, you can set that up so that he has to sign all requisitions uh, based on that. Uh, product line approval uh, has to do with uh, ordering inventory and purchase items. You can have uh, requisitions for uh, actual purchase orders within a product line. Some people just use the PSYOP functionality 
to do that, but you can define uh, particular product lines, who's going to sign for product line and their approval levels. Uh, buyers need to define be defined in GRS so that the system can uh, route that correctly. And then creating a requisition in 5.2.3 uh, just basically defines who you want. If you check that little checkbox in the control file that says you can't uh, change an approved requisition, you get this little error that says uh, you you need to go back and uh, either delete the rec or get with the particular originator. Uh, but it uh, it can be a somewhat frustrating aspect. Uh, the header for the requisition is pretty much the same as uh, a purchase order. Uh, who entered it, who required it, uh, who's using it, the status, the approval status. Then at the line level, you need to uh, define the item type, uh, suppliers. I remember Lori, uh, one of the buyers I used to work with, uh, she always can was confused by buyers or requisitioners who didn't know how to fill out uh, requisitions. So uh, users need to be educated as to how to use these uh, requisitions within QAD. Uh, then you got the approval matrix. You put in your uh, rec number that you're going to approve, and it allows you to take action, deny, uh, reverse, whatever you need to do. It'll send you off uh, automatic notifications, <coughs> and then you can uh, go in and actually route the requisition itself if you uh, feel you need to do that. Again, it's got email, and this needs to be set up uh, correctly. The administration and execution of routing maintenance uh, is critical, especially when you have uh, managers leaving the organization, people getting promoted. This was always one of the biggest challenges we had was to make sure that uh, the global requisition uh, system matched what the current uh, organization structure looked like. Then once the uh, requisition is approved and uh, distributed, uh, you can build a PO from a requisition. Uh, requisition delete and archive, uh, this is controlled by your uh, retention policies, your SOX uh, issues, uh, we basically ignored this and never deleted anything out of the system, so it was always uh, available. And I wanted to walk you through just a uh, quick uh, look at MRP and how MRP deals with uh, requisitions. Here's uh, MRP summary report. Well, here we've got a planned order that MRP has planned. Uh, won't go how that happens, but again, you can go back and look at the webinars to look at how MRP is going to generate a planned order. Uh, you can review those action messages, uh, update the action messages, delete, archive the action messages, uh, <clears throat> and then you can go through and do the 22311 plan purchase order approval. Uh, and here, this approves. Planned orders, uh, if you want to default the approval or not, I always recommend not approving that. This will bring you up a list of all of the requisitions that are defined in your selection criteria. Uh, you select the line, then you uh, check whether that particular uh, requisition is approved, then that is uh, approved, you check yes. That then is going to change the planned order into a requisition. The requisition then is uh, processed through requisition maintenance uh, header, line, trailer, uh, and then routing the requisition. Uh, you can route the requisition uh, to a final buyer uh, in purchasing. <clears throat> and then uh, the buyer gets that requisition does the build PO from requisition uh, field, and that then creates a purchase order associated with the requisition itself that has automatic email distribution to the buyer and the uh, people who have originated the requisition. 
and then finally you've got uh, in MRP the fact that the planned order has turned into a requisition which has then turned into a purchase order. So if you're doing a good job of uh, controlling your MRP process, you can use the planned order approval uh, to generate all of your uh, requisitions for purchase items. <clears throat> as far as the purchase order maintenance concern, uh, again, you can use MRP. We'll talk about supplier schedules uh, next week. Uh, you've got the requisition, or you can just uh, enter data into uh, 5.7. We'll also cover a little bit about uh, blanket purchase orders. The purchase order header basically has a header, line information, uh, however many lines you might have in that purchase order, and then a trailer for the uh, purchase order. The purchase order maintenance 5.7 is used to create the order itself. And this basically turns into uh, a contract that we mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, at the line level, you've got a whole series of uh, field elements that uh, you're going to be uh, creating and uh, selecting due date, performance dates, uh, <coughs> projects, uh, types of requisitions, et cetera. And then down here, it's going to give you some uh, translations if you've got unit to measure conversions and what, what that would mean in terms of stocking and extended uh, prices. There's the purchase order trailer. Uh, this little uh, box here, order revision. Uh, the system is now going to ask you uh, if the modifications you've made by going through 5.7 require a order revision in what that order revision date is. Uh, you've also got the PO print flag. If you want to print the PO, you can only do it once unless you come back into the trailer and recheck that box so that you can print uh, POs and then your uh, status. Blanket orders in uh, QED are uh, basically long-term agreements between the buyers and the sellers at agreed upon uh, periods, quantities, prices. After it's accepted by both the supplier and the buyer, <clears throat> then releases can be made against the purchase order or the blanket purchase order periodically or as when required for a specific order without calling for a new purchase order. So the blanket order uh, is used to maintain and record this uh, process, you basically create the, the uh, blanket order and then create PO releases against that, starting at a start date and an end date. You can also have different types of blanket orders, irregular or recurring, which we'll talk about in just a second. Here's the header, just some basic information uh, about the supplier. Then MRP doesn't recognize this, is one of the shortcomings, I think in terms of blanket orders is MRP doesn't recognize blanket quantities as sources of supply. Uh, you also cannot uh, process a PO receipt against a blanket order and you cannot use blanket orders for subcontracting. So they're basically just templates uh, for creating purchase orders, which then you can uh, have these additional functionality. You've got uh, details associated with the particular blanket order, uh, what the order date is, the due date, the buyers, uh, that type of information. Then you've got uh, the blanket order frame that comes up in 5.3.1. And here you've got the blanket start and end date, and then uh, the release quantity. And when you go into 5.3.1, you have to have that check yes in order to release a purchase order. And then you can have a recurring flag uh, associated with a cycle code. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Here's the line details for uh, the blanket order. Uh, this quantity received will tell you what you've actually received. And then the quantity to release is critical. You've got to check that box on the header level, 
and then you can define what the quantity is that you're going to release to a purchase order from this blanket. <clears throat> There's trailer information, same basically as a purchase order, and then you've got 5.3.6 blanket or release to a purchase order, and that cycle count or cycle code, you can release these based on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, a semi-annual, annual basis. That then will create the actual purchase order. Uh, subcontracting is another function. You need to define your uh, routing maintenance. So you create a uh, subcontract router for a particular supplier. Uh, you need operation to send the material out for the supplier to add value, return it to the factory inspection, and send it back to stock. So you create a manufacturing work order, you cut the work order, issue the parts, apply labor if necessary, ship the work order out to the supplier, receive it back to the supplier, inspect, and put it back into stock on the work order itself. Then you create a purchase order line for the subcontract. If you put the purchase order line type to S, it will pop up this uh, little pop-up box that allows you to put in the work order, the ID, and the operation that uh, this is going to be associated. Then when you receive the 513-1 material on the PO, the dollars of that purchase order are then debited to the work order. And then when you uh, actually do the 16.11 work order receipt, uh that money for the subcontract is going to go into the work order and then you can see that in uh, 16.3.4 your work order cost uh, reports if you use advanced repetitive you can uh, use uh, this subcontracting shipping menu uh, this allows you much greater control for the subcontract process in terms of po containers uh, automated ship notices PO shippers, refunction, or receipt functions, etc. So what you need to do is once you've got the purchase orders set, your subcontracts received, then you're going to do a purchase order receipt. So this is uh, puts the quantity into inventory and generates receivers for uh, matching the receipt to the PO to the invoice that uh, is received by accounts payable. And then when you receive items in the inventory, uh, the system debits the inventory account maintenance. It debits or credits purchase price variance, depending. Credits PO receipt accounts, and then credits your overhead uh, applied accounts as defined in uh, 1.2.5, the account maintenance. <clears throat> so if you got purchase order receipt, this is uh, the purchase order receipts and returns menu. Uh, the three primary ones are purchase order receipts, purchase order returns, and uh, unmatched PO receipts. As of date, we'll talk a little bit more about that in March when we uh, talk about costing. But uh, inspection, lots of business issues to consider with uh, business uh, issues. Uh, where are you going to receive it? What kind of documentation, lead time? Uh, vendor quality uh, returns, etc. So there's uh, a number of areas that you need to do with purchase order receipts and returns. Here's the purchase order uh, receipt header where you put in the PO. Second frame of the 513.1 allows you to put in the quantity that you're going to receive. If you put it into a location, if you've got lot control, you define those. And then that is going to uh, be processed into inventory. And at that point, you're going to create a RCT-PO uh, transaction in regards to the unit of measure conversion. So this question is all information correct. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be correct because it's somewhat difficult to uh, return it. We've got the tools of receiving, intermediate conversions, RCTPOs, and uh, ISS.PRV, uh, the returns function. And uh, in 3.21, you always want to make sure that you check to make sure your, your transaction has recorded properly. 
As far as uh, purchase order research returns are concerned, uh, you always uh, want to have really good controls from the point of 513.1 PO receipt in terms of locations, transactions, movements to the 513.7, the purchase order returns uh, function. Uh, all of that activity has to be uh, critical. If you uncheck this uh, return to replace, you're basically doing a return for credit only. If you check that box, and this is uh, important, if that is checked, then the system is going to add a new line to the original purchase order for the returned quantity. It's not going to open up the original line it was received on. It's going to add a new uh, line. And this must always be coordinated with uh, accounts payable. So these fields in inventory, when you do a purchase or return, have to match uh, inventory and accounts payable. So uh, purchase or returns are somewhat uh, difficult. 32Soft has a number of related loaders associated with purchasing, uh, supplier item loads, uh, PO workbench, if you uh, want to uh, have any information about that, contact Alex or uh, Denise or myself. We'd be really glad to give you uh, an update on that. So today we've talked about suppliers, items, conversions, purchase control, a little bit about MRP, some uh, detail about requisitions, discrete purchase orders, subcontract, uh, blanket orders, and receipts. And then next month, we're going to talk uh, about our second uh, inventory control uh, webinar. And then in March on the 18th, I'll come back and we'll talk about supplier schedules, consignment, cost sets, uh, supplier pricing, a little bit of accounts receivable, and uh, supplier performance. So. So I'm going to take a quick look. This is where we would go right into the Q&A, but I believe we only had the one question about whether the recording would be available, and yes, it will. Yes. Um, let me take just another quick look. Yeah, that was the only question we had received, but please know if you have any questions, um, feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email, and any questions we receive up until the recording is published will be included within a questions and answers section just beneath the recording itself. So being conscientious of everyone's time, we'll go ahead and just move along. Um, Don just mentioned these two upcoming webinars, uh, gave you a little bit more detail. We also have a couple of upcoming conferences. We've got the uh, Midwest User Group in March, followed by the West Coast User Group in April. and. Everyone here today knows the importance and value of an efficient supply chain, but I had never quite thought about it in this way. It is not the organizations that are competing, it's the supply chains that are complete competing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Hope you do too. Um, Don or Alex, anything else we need to add today before we go ahead and wrap up? Uh, just a uh, uh, blanket statement about purchasing. It's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's your window onto the world. It is uh, probably, at least in my estimation, one of the most important things that uh, the supply chain controls because you don't grow the things you're going to build. You need to buy it. You need to have uh trustworthy suppliers you need to have accurate data so the whole uh, gestalt of purchasing is critical to the way that we uh, operate our uh, supply chains and we'll cover uh, a fair amount more uh, we've just kind of touched the service as regard to uh, purchase functionality in qad and we'll we'll talk more about that in uh, in march so yep again, actually don we did mm -hmm. get a uh, we did get a last minute question. If anyone is able to oh, hang on okay. here, sure, sure. Uh, the question is: We currently use supplier schedules for outside processes. Mm -hmm. Would it be better Would it be better to use the subcontractor function? These are product parts sent out, a process is done, and then they are returned as a new production part number. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that uh, extensively in March. We talk about supplier schedules, but the supplier schedule functionality in QED is quite extensive when it comes to uh, subcontracting. 
so I would uh, I would recommend that uh, you look at that whole uh, subcontracting functionality that one overhead that I uh, did PO containers ASNs uh, PO shippers etc cetera, etc cetera. and we'll cover more more of that uh, in March. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you, Don. And thank you, everybody, very much for taking the time to join us today. Hopefully, you found the time to be well spent. And we certainly hope you will join us again next month. Have and, a super day, everybody. And Don? Happy New Year. Happy New and Year. Happy New Year again. <laughs> See you all soon, hopefully. Have a great day. Good bye day. Bye bye.